Jeremiah 32, we were reading a, a passage in our scripture reading this evening that begins basically with Jeremiah being told by the Lord to purchase a, a field in, in Judah and Judea. And you'd think, well, why would, why would the Lord have him do that since they were going to be carried away into captivity shortly and they would be gone from the land in Babylon for 70 years during that captivity? And uh, the reason was God wanted to communicate his hope for the future uh, through this act. And so the, the deed would be preserved and saved. And Jeremiah would have this land. But of course, he would never occupy that land in the future. But it did tell people that they were coming back, that God was going to bring his people back into the land and do as he has promised. And um, early, early this morning, I was thinking about this passage in Jeremiah 32, and particularly the uh, passage as it begins in verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth, and notice this phrase, by your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. Now remember, if he did that, it's a much lesser thing than to bring, you know, to bring Israel back into the land after 70 years, right? He created all things. There's nothing too hard for you, he says. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. I love that title there. So the text to this point is telling us that God made the heavens and the earth, the great and mighty God, by the power of his outstretched hand. Now when God created, he created everything that is around us from nothing. All the universe and the worlds God created from nothing. We like to say that we're creative or that we create things, but we really don't. We make things uh, from that which God has created. Right? They already exist for us. God took and created everything that we see out of nothing at all. And he shows, he, he says in the text here, both loving kindness and then he also uh, repays iniquity. He does both of those things. Both love and justice meet together or harmoniously really in the character of God. And so he is the great and the mighty God who is whose name is the Lord of hosts. He goes on to say, You are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Notice that it says he is great in counsel, and that's the counsel that we receive from him. He is great and mighty in work. It says in the text, the work that he does on our behalf. There is nothing that God cannot accomplish, whether it's the creative activity itself, creating everything that we see from nothing, or bringing uh, Israel back into Judea as he promised, or, or saving our souls and providing redemption for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the great and the mighty God. Inasmuch as there is none like you, the text goes on to say, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all the kingdoms, there is none like you. This is from Jeremiah 10, building on this theme of great and mighty God. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz, the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Indignation, this righteous indignation and anger that God has for sin. 
Now, I read the, the heart of Jeremiah 10 to you there in verses 6 through 10, but the whole passage opens with the idea of idolatry. Sometimes people find uh, a Christmas tree in the beginning of Jeremiah 10, but it's kind of silly. The idea there is Jeremiah is, is, say, is pointing up the uniqueness of how mighty God is. There is none like him. Men can cult together all of these different things, all of these facts. They have their philosophies, they have their psychologies, but they don't approach the greatness of God. They have their versions of truth that are not truth at all. Men are, are dull-hearted, he says, and they are foolish. Their idols are worthless, and they're illusory. They're, they have a sense of greatness about them, and they might even occupy our thoughts from time to time because they're right there in front of us. They're all that we can see at times. This is the problem with idolatry. It's so attractive. If it wasn't attractive, we wouldn't have a problem with it. And so that, that's the point that he's trying to make. God is true, and the lesser gods that we have been serving are false. And so that, that's the point that the text is making here. He is living, they are dead. God is eternal, they are passing away. He is powerful, and they are powerless before him. As a matter of fact, they have no power at all. They're just being manufactured from the hands of men. We always want to believe in something as men and women. Um, we, we want something that we can cling to. It's amazing how we have this penchant for belief. Mm -hmm. It's the whole thing that ramps up conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's why Christians get wrapped up in conspiracy theory, because we want to believe stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's kind of the direction that we're going anyway by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. There are good things to believe in, like Jesus himself and the scriptures, and there are things that we shouldn't waste our time with. God seeks for those who will worship him. But remember what the scriptures teach in the New Testament. Those who are true worshipers of God worship in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit indwelling us. John 4 and verse 23. If men can see and handle their gods, that's good for them because then they can control their own fate. Or at least they have this illusion that they can control their own fate. I mean, if you can create and handle your own gods, then you can make them go in any direction that you want them to. And you can rationalize any action that you take away. But as Christians, we serve an everlasting king. And this text is teaching us that he's sovereign over all. And we can't tell him which direction we're going to go. We can't control him. He controls us. There can only be one sovereign. And God alone is our sovereign king. If, if we were in our right minds, by the way, we wouldn't want it any other way. We would want it exactly that way. We want God to control us. We don't want to control our own lives. We make, we make a, a mess of things. Now notice that earlier in the Jeremiah 32 passage, his name is the Lord of hosts. Now that name is particularly important in the prophecy of Jeremiah. I won't go through through all the statistics that are here, but over 70 times it's mentioned in the scriptures, but, but when you boil it down, it's there in 29 of 52 chapters in the prophecy of Jeremiah. So it becomes a very significant title for God. The Lord of hosts, or Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, the God of armies, so a, a militant term. God controls these armies. Uh, the angelic hosts, where... Uh, Gehazi's eyes had to be opened so that he could see it by the prophet uh, Elisha. So here is God's host fighting against sin wherever it is found. And those who are on God's side fight against it as well. Mm -hmm. And so as it relates to his character, there are eight verses that specifically state God's name as the Lord of hosts in Jeremiah. I have them listed here on the screen. But it, it, it occurs eight times. And the reference that is in chapter 32 that you see in the midst of them uh, refers to the Lord of hosts as the great and mighty God. And so I thought over the next few Wednesdays, we would, we would really just meditate on that name and the power of God as we pray. Because we need that. We need God's greatness. We need his power. And we need it from four perspectives. 
Tonight's perspective is he's the great and mighty God of truth, but we're also going to look at the great and mighty God who is the creator. We're also going to look at the great and mighty God who is the king. And then there will be a fourth week where we'll look at the great and mighty God who is the redeemer. So first of all, let's look at this idea of the great and mighty God who is the truth. It says in Jeremiah 10, continuing where we left off, He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. And has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image, for he molded for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. So notice the contrast. Falsehood with the great and mighty God of truth. They are futile, a work of errors in the time of their punishment. They shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. Let me just skip over my explanatory phrase there in parentheses. For he is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So we have to understand what is meant by this idea of the portion of Jacob. And we find it out by looking at it within the context. The futile work of errors, the images of the metalsmiths, all of the false idols really presenting a contrast for us. Um, over and against the backdrop of the great and mighty God of truth. You know, if you pay attention to that passage in Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 12, and you go to the end of the prophecy in chapter 51, it is almost verbatim repeated in that particular passage. So it's really, really important. When God says something once, it's important. But when he says it twice in the same prophecy, it's very important. And so the idea behind this is when we read the portion of Jacob in the text is not like them, it says in the text. We go to the context, right, in order to figure out what he's saying. Not like them. Who, who are they? Who are the them that's being referred to? Well, the futile work of errors. These idols that Israel had been worshiping. The images of the metalsmith's hands. That is, it's a clear reference to all of the false idolatry that was going on in, in Israel. But that idolatry is still present today. Not in, in silver figurines that we worship, uh, but in all of the different things that we do in order to marginalize God in our lives. In other words, we don't want the truth. Kind of reminds me of that movie, I can't remember. You, you don't want the truth, you can't handle the truth, right? And, and that's how people are. They, they can't handle the truth of God's word. God is the maker of all things. He's even the maker of the metalsmith himself who is creating this false image. And so we're using the things that God has created against him. He's the truth. He's the great and mighty God of truth, the Lord of hosts. And he's going to do battle against that kind of philosophy and against that kind of mindset. He has before, and he certainly will again. He is powerful, and they are powerless. Now, let me just say tonight, um, we can deny this all we want. But we're not unlike the man in Australia who denied that he ever needed to use a seatbelt. And he wouldn't use a seatbelt. He had been cited over 50 times over the the space of about five years. And so he got sick of getting a ticket, so he developed this little strap that he would put over his shoulder when he'd get into his car, but it wasn't connected to anything. So it was just something that was kind of a false idea that, yeah, I have this seatbelt on. It wasn't truth. And he found out. He, he got in a head-on collision. He was ejected from the car, and he was killed. And there was a, a newspaper article about it. 
here's a man that relied upon deception. It worked for a little while, and in the article discussing the accident, the coroner said this, though his car was fitted with seat belts, an extra belt with a long strap had been knotted above the seat belt on the driver's side, providing a belt to simply sit over the driver's shoulder. And when that belt was truly tested, what happened to that man? He was killed. That's why you need the great and mighty God of truth. Mm. We are not unlike that man driving around with this false seatbelt over us thinking that we're okay. And we've marginalized God, we've pushed him out of our lives, and we're heading into this wreck. And sooner or later, we're going to come to the end of ourselves. This is pretty important. So Jeremiah couldn't accomplish the work that God had for him without depending upon the fact that God had imparted truth to him. And Jeremiah was not relying upon a false seatbelt. He had difficulty going through all of this, to be sure. They didn't call him the weeping prophet for nothing. But, but the scripture teaches us that God imparted the truth to him, and he clung to that truth. Are we clinging to the truth of God? Or do we have some kind of false seatbelt hanging over us thinking that it's going to protect us? Mm. And the false seatbelts, they look like a great many of things that are around us. Politics, psychology, all, all the different philosophies that we see in the world. I'm reminded of Ravi Zacharias, this great apologist who did many great things for the church. But all the while, he was a fraud. He, he was somebody that had this facade of, of tenderness and sensitivity and intellect that was pretty weighty, but, but he had been abusing and raping women and doing all manner of evil things while living this dualistic life. And the bottom dropped out and he was, he was exposed for what he truly was. It was a false seat though. But the word of God, when we fearlessly proclaim it in a corrupt culture, it will never fail. It's amazing. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty definitive. He is the definitive truth. And so there is no other truth. There is no other God. There is no other seatbelt out there that will protect us. So why do you believe what you believe? That's what you need to ask yourself this evening before you pray. And if you agree with me that God is the only truth, then when you go to him in prayer, there's going to be this deep, settled assurance that he's going to lead you in the right direction. And he will never fail you. I love what Psalm 73 verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Same idea, portion. He is my portion forever. Jesus has made it possible for us. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to remember what we were. We were false and full of sin, as the hymn writer said. He's made it possible for us who were false and full of sin to become his friends. And his truth has set us free. He is the truth that has set us free. All things that he heard from the Father, he's made known to us. And so as we go to prayer tonight, we need to rejoice in the great and mighty God of truth because the Lord of hosts is his name. Let's pray. Father, how thankful we are for your character and for your great love for us. We pray that as we live our lives, we would rely upon what you reveal to us. And Lord, I can't think of another reason why we need to be in our in our Bibles every day alone with you. Because there's just so many different voices out there that are distracting. And Lord, we need to be refocused. So when we get up in the morning, just give us Jesus. And when we go to bed at night, just give us Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray for his sake.